I was asked by the proprietor of a local fly shop here recently to do a class on some bonefish patterns. He had a group of people going down to South Andros to fish for some bonefish and there are a number of productive patterns that are used down there um, that work very very well so he asked if I would do a class on them. So this fly that I'm doing today is on one of the patterns. I've got two others in the next couple of weeks that will be coming out. This is the Iborski's no-named shrimp. Sometimes this is also referred to as a craft fur shrimp, but I know it as, like I said, the Borski's no-named shrimp. Very, very basic pattern. Um, craft fur tail, a little bit of flash and hackle body. That's it. The eyes, the dumbbell eyes, um, these are a lead dumbbell eyes, but you could certainly substitute a bead chain in there if you need something that uh, isn't going to make such a splash or needs to sink quite so fast. Very simple basic pattern, works great for bonefish, it's a great shrimp imitation. Uh, imagine you could use this for redfish as well, but um, we're going to go ahead and tie this up for some bonefish and we'll go ahead and get started. We'll start the no-name shrimp by putting our hook in the vise. This is a Mustad 34007. You could use a Tiemco 811S if you want. Uh, if you want a longer body, you could go with, say, a, a Mustad 34011. But this is a standard saltwater shrimp hook. After I debarb that, I'm going to attach my thread. For thread, I'm just using a Danville uh, Flymasters Plus in a tan. You could use like a 140 denier Wapsi or even a 6 Danville if you want. Um, it isn't that critical that you have a real heavy thread on this. I'm going to attach my thread so that it's about an eye length behind the eye of the hook. I'm going to leave it right there because that's where I'm going to put the dumbbell eyes on. Now the eyes on this are also the weight for this fly like a lot of shrimp flies. The weight uh, that you put in the eyes is going to be dictated by your fishing conditions. If you're in real shallow water with spooky fish, you may want to have no eyes on this or you may want to do, say, a gold bead chain or something like that, especially if you're, that's what you're looking for is that yellow goldish color. Um, otherwise, if you're in a deeper water, it needs to go down fast, you can use a regular painted dumbbell eyes in a small, medium, or large. I'm using a medium on this one. If I were to uh, need this to be a little bit heavier to go down deeper, I have a couple choices. I could go with a, a large dumbbell eye or I could put the dumbbell eyes on and then a few wraps of lead right back here. It really just depends. A lot of people who are going out for bonefish will actually take multiple different flies anywhere from blind, meaning there's no eyes on it, to light bead chain, and then all the way up to um, a heavier lead, just so that they're prepared for whatever conditions they have. Now the one thing you'll notice that when I uh, wrap these dumbbell eyes on, I'm actually wrapping them on the underside of the hook here. Now they still, the fly will still ride hook point up like this because the weight is in a position where it does flip over the center of gravity on this, uh, but um, it that's just how the fly is made with the eyes on the inside of, or I should say the underside of the hook shank. I'm going to advance my thread all the way back down to the end of the shank to tie in the tail. The, the Borski's No Name Shrimp is actually a very, very simple basic pattern. Other than the dumbbell eyes and the hook, there's only three ingredients. There's a craft fur tail that is uh, in a tan color that I'm using here uh, that's tied in. A little bit of flash accent is put in. This is a pearl flash accent that's going to be put in. And then for the body and actually for the legs as well, I'm using a grizzly rooster saddle. This is a Whiting American grizzly uh, rooster saddle. This is a darker one. Um, I like the contrast a little bit better, but you could go with something less, um, I guess, uh, stark contrast. So using a tan 
grizzly or even a Cree or something like that would still give you some of the contrasting colors, but maybe not stand out as much. So for the tail, the first ingredient is going to be the craft fur. I'm going to go ahead and select a fairly good sized clump of craft fur. I'm going to cut right straight down off of the hide. If you've never worked with craft fur before, it is very similar to working with um, any other kind of uh, mammal fur actually because you have very very long strands here like this but down at the base you have very very short strands and even what some people refer to as under fur and I think it's just referred to as under fur because it's it's easier because you, you handle this just like you would say bucktail or deer hair or something like that I don't need all of this uh, shorter fibers in the bulk right here, so I want to take that out. I'm going to hold the whole clump right about the midpoint here, and then with my other hand I'm gently going to pull, and you can see how that separates and just comes out very, very easy. I do want to set those aside as they make very good dubbing, and in a few weeks I have another video on a mantis shrimp, shrimp pattern that we use this actually is for dubbing of the body. But you'll notice now that I have much less bulk in here while keeping the, the very long fibers. However, I do have a lot of fibers here that are much longer but, but sparser than they are back in this area. So what I want to do is I want to hold the tips and then grab the butt ends here with my right hand and I'm just going to pull those apart. And then I'm going to remarry the sh shorter fibers in my right hand with the very long fibers so that the tips are a little more even. And what this does is it simply is going to bulk up the tail just a little bit, but I'm not going to end up with a lot of real long sparse fibers out here. Now I want actually this tail, I, it needs to be a little bit thicker, so I'm going to add a little bit more craft fur to that. And I'm just going to go through the same procedure I did before. When I cut that off, I'll run through this again for you. I'm going to hold that right about the middle, gently stroke with my right hand, pulling all of that long, longer fibers and the under fur out. Now you notice this has uh, got a lot of static electricity in it. Uh, very common, aside from it being in the winter time and drier air. Very common even in the summer. You can wet your fingers just a little bit and stroke those like this and it's going to collect those and make them a little bit more manageable. But just as before, I will grab the very long fibers here, pull those out and remarry those back together so that I have not quite so uh, long and sparse tips on this. If you got any that are kind of bent or going off weird, go ahead and pull those out. But you can see here on the other side where I have these much longer fibers here um, are sticking out. That's how much longer they were. But then I'll take this and marry it with the, the previous group that I had and then bring that up to the hook like so. And that gives me just a little bit fuller tail. I want to tie this in. I'm using the whole hook which is in, the, in front of the eye, eye of the hook to the bend of the hook as my measuring tool and I'm going to do two hook lengths. So I'll measure those out and right about there is where I'm going to tie that in. I want to cut this so that it's just behind the dumbbell eyes so that I can use that as kind of a base for the body. So I trim those off about the right length, a little bit more. Sometimes the craft fur can be a, kind of tricky to, to trim. It tends to move out of the way. Set those up so that the ends right here are right behind the dumbbell eyes. A little pinch wrap here. I get those anchored down. I'll wrap down to the end of the shank, securing the tail. And then I'm just going to wrap back up, touching turns on up to the dumbbell eyes. And this is just to secure those craft fur fibers down along the hook shank. Like I said, it, it makes the body a little bit thicker, but also it gives it a nice uh, tan color uh, base for the body. 
So that's the tail. We're going to put in some uh, flash accent here, but before we do that, I'm going to put in, uh, um, I've got to put in some stripes on this. We're going to add some markings in here just to give this a little bit more contrast. I'm using just a brown sharpie for this. You could use black if you want or something a little lighter brown. Uh, it just depends on the overall color that you're going for with the fly. All I'm going to do is take the tip of the sharpie and I'm just going to touch it to each side of the craft fur. You'll notice that when I do this, the craft fur actually kind of draws the ink out of the sharpie. So you don't want to touch it and hold it on there too long because it will draw out enough that you'll end up with, you know, a wide uh, band or almost even just they'll blend together. So you're just going to touch it a little bit here to give it a little bit of contrast and color, and that's it. Wouldn't get too hung up on how many you put in there uh, or their positioning and so on. This is just going to give a little bit of contrast to the fly to catch the eye of, of the fish. So for my accent, I'm going to take a couple strands of flash accent and I'm going to bring that up under the thread on my side here, getting one end about the same length as the tail. A couple of wraps coming back down and I can then fold over the other two to the other side and secure those in. I do want them to be on both sides of the tail and not on the bottom here because remember this is going to flip over like this when it is swimming in the, in the water. If I have any of these fibers a little long, I'm going to cut them so they're about the same length as the tail. So that is our tail section. We're going to tie in our rooster hackle here and palmer that to make the body and that will complete the No Name Shrimp. With the tail completed on our No Name Shrimp, we're ready to put in the body of the fly, and the body is done with just a rooster saddle hackle. You could use, like say, a strong rooster saddle, even a schloppen if you want. They may be a little webbier um, than what you need because you're looking for the fibers here to stand out and um, act as though they're legs. I'm selecting a rather long hackle because I'm going to have to put a lot of wraps in this. I'm going to isolate the tip of the, the feather and then I'm going to tie that in right back at the end of the shank and then wrap forward. I'm not concerned about touching turns and covering that up as you'll see when we finish the fly if there's a little bit of color inside here that doesn't, doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start palmering this forward, but when I do, I want each wrap here to more or less be um, have the equivalent of a wrap in between each. As I get up about halfway, I'm going to actually start wrapping a little bit closer to each other so that the front part of this is a little denser than the, the rear part. That's just how I like to tie them. Some people tie these where they're all evenly spaced. If you have a real long feather, I suppose you could have each wrap right in front of the other one. But as you can see, I've got a little bit of space in between each wrap, which is what I'm looking for. And then when I get about halfway up here, I'll start wrapping each one right in front of the previous one. A lot of these fibers are going to be trimmed away to leave just some on the underside representing legs. When I get up to the dumbbell eyes, if I have enough, I'm going to put in an extra wrap or two right behind the dumbbell eyes. I'm not concerned if some of the, the fluffier stuff is getting tied in. I just want to make certain I'm kind of filling in that space. Stroking all this back, I'm going to bring my thread right around two or three times, and then I can cut off the excess feather. Again, stroking these fibers back, I will go ahead and 
wrap down all of those so they are pressed backwards a little bit and then I'm going to put some crisscross wraps across the dumbbell eyes and that's just to turn around and kind of smooth off the area around between the dumbbell eyes. I come forward, put in a few wraps just to tidy that up and then I can put in a four or five turn whip finish. Not really concerned about this fly being really delicate in terms of uh, how the head is finished and everything so I'm not flattening my thread or anything like that. This is a fishing fly and it's basically tied and made to uh, to be fished and a little bit more rugged. I'm taking some fly tight and I will soak down all the thread around the dumbbell eyes and the head here. That's just going to help protect it a little bit as this is bouncing around on the bottom. You could potentially put a little epoxy on there and on here if you want to or some UV just to protect that a little bit. That's up to you. Now these hackle fibers on on these two sides here and on the bottom or should say well the bottom of the fly what looks like the top right now are not needed. What I'm looking for are, are some of these longer fibers with this nice taper here for legs. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start by chopping off not right down to the body. I want to leave just a little bit, um, some stubs right there. Just adds a little more bulk to the body. And then I will move over to the sides, getting those fibers right off the sides. Be careful not to cut your flash accent off. And then I will get the other side. I don't get too hung up on this if I've got a few that are like this one sticking out right on the bottom here and I generally would not worry about it. Um, I think it still looks buggy enough for um, legs. These are a little bit long for me so I'm just going to isolate some of those, cut those out like that. What I'm looking for is just something like this so that when this is in the water swimming these will look like legs or something trying to scoot that shrimp along. So with that done and the head cement on there, um, our Borski No Name Shrimp is done. One thing I did want to point out is I don't have a weed guard on this. I'm not a big fan of weed guards. Most of the places I've ever fished, they, are, they get in the way more than they help. So I don't tie in weed guards on most of my flies unless it's genuinely required. If you're going to put in a weed guard, it's generally going to go in right behind the eye of the hook and before the dumbbell eyes. So you'll want to mount these eyes a little bit further back, leaving yourself a little bit of room to put the weed guard in. But other than that, that is the Borski's No Name shrimp, sometimes referred to as a uh, craft fur shrimp. Very simple pattern. You can change up some of the colors if you want a little olive. Most of your saltwater shrimp tend to be a lighter color with dark banding on them. So you can even do like a cream color if you wanted to, or something a little bit uh, that would blend in even a little bit more. But there is the Borski's No Name Shrimp. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this video and not only learned a new pattern, but maybe learned some new techniques and a few new skills. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button below. You can support Dressed Irons by hitting the subscribe button and don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notified when new videos are published. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Until next time, remember, it's fly time. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong.